Euromax Highlights. And here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Greetings from the German capital and welcome to our Highlights edition, which this time around includes the following stories. Androgynous chic, Rat Hurani unveils a unisex collection at the Paris Haute Couture shows. Metal Vintage, a German vintner discovers a new niche with wines for headbangers. And Capital Affair, a French journalist looks back on a decade in Berlin. Well, he was born in 1938 as Hans-Georg Kern, but sometime around the age of 23, he changed his name to Georg Baselitz. And that was a takeoff on his birthplace, the small Saxon town of Deutsch Baselitz. And from those humble beginnings, he went on to become one of Germany's best-known contemporary artists. Well, Baselitz turned 75 on January 23rd, and so we met up with him for a birthday tribute in Austria. Upside Down Images, a hallmark of Georg Baselitz's work. The Essler Museum near Vienna is currently showing works that he created between 1968 and 2012. The celebrated artist has come to the show that is being staged to mark his 75th birthday. His career stretches back more than 50 years, and these days the kind of work that he does can take its toll. It can be tough. I paint my pictures on the floor. So every day I put on rubber knee guards and crawl around for two or three hours. So it's understandable that I have problems standing up straight afterwards. After all, I am 75. Georg Baselitz is one of Germany's most eminent contemporary artists. The former Enfant Terrible still isn't afraid of causing controversy. Curator Karl-Heinz Essel has known him 20 years. I must say he's extremely honest and almost self-destructive because he refuses to compromise or to whitewash things. If he doesn't like something, he speaks his mind, without considering the consequences. And you can see that quality in his work, too. Baselitz was born in the state of Saxony, which became part of communist East Germany while he was still in his youth. He studied art in East Berlin before being expelled from university for non-conformist behavior. In 1958, he reluctantly moved to West Berlin. But here, too, people took exception to his work. His first solo exhibition in 1963 showed art that many considered scandalous. Baselitz remained an outsider. It was awful back then. I didn't have anything to eat. I had a lousy apartment. I didn't have anything to wear. Once I collapsed because I was starving, I was aware of the freedom around me, but I couldn't actually participate in it. Baselitz began what has been called inverted painting in 1969. The artist was constantly striving to break with convention. His motifs were often inspired by people and issues close to his heart. His Russian paintings, which he began creating in the 1990s, were his attempt to come to terms with German reunification. He also began reinterpreting his own art. In 2005, he began taking motifs from his early work and reinventing them. He called them remixes. His sculptures also featured his private life. This wooden sculpture is a representation of his wife, Elke. In Mahler, it's beautiful. A painter has an easy time of things. If he takes everything that fills his head from birth onwards and uses that content, then he's got everything he needs. But it is very intimate. It's very private. And if it's private enough, then strangely enough, it'll usually interest people. The artist's works have been on show in big-name art museums for the last 30 years. His paintings fetch millions on the international art market. Art expert Heinz-Peter Schwafel regards Baselitz as one of the world's most important contemporary painters. When you walk around, it's very hard to say whether a work dates from the 1970s or from 2000 onwards. 
It's very difficult if you don't know his work. And I think that's also something that's typical for Baselitz. He's a unique figure in art history. And that's why you can't say who his influences are or who his heirs will be. From enfant terrible to star of the international art scene, Georg Baselitz managed to make it big and remain at the top of his game, even at the age of 75. So what's he planning now? I'd like to drink a little less if I can. Other things like being disciplined, not giving up. Everything that happens up here has to be committed to paper. During his 50-year career, Georg Baselitz has never stopped inventing and reinventing things. He's an artist who always has turned the art world on its head. Well, January 22nd marked 50 years since the Élysée Treaty was signed in Reims in France back in 1963. Well, that's when German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer and French President Charles de Gaulle shook hands to symbolize a new post-war era of Franco-German relations, a necessary move at the time to assuage still lingering tensions between the two nations. Well, in light of this, we met up with French journalist Cécile Calla, who wouldn't be living quite so happily in Berlin today if it hadn't been for the Treaty of Friendship. Cécile Kala is a French journalist based in Berlin. She reports on politics and the arts in Germany. In the 10 years she's lived here, she's learned a lot. There are many differences between our two countries. Fewer French people are learning German, and fewer Germans are learning French. It's actually worse in France. A lack of linguistic knowledge leads to a lack of mutual understanding. Kala is the editor-in-chief of Paris Berlin magazine. She aims to tell it like it is and convey a realistic image of the country she writes about. There are lots of prejudices and preconceptions to sweep aside. Clichés can be soothing. They tell you where you stand, enhance your sense of identity, and define the other. Paris Berlin is a bilingual production. It has an office in Berlin and in Paris. It covers politics, business, the arts, and society in the two countries. We want to create an exchange between Germany and France. We report about both. It's always French people who write about Germany and vice versa. We want to create a dialogue to convey different points of view. Cécile Kala came to Berlin in 2003 as a correspondent for the newspaper Le Figaro, and she stayed. She lives here with her husband and two children. At first, she marveled at the differences in culture and way of life. There were all kinds of things in everyday life that were new to me. Little things, details really, but I wanted to record them and write about them. It's easy to forget them rather quickly after the initial surprise, but they actually tell you quite a lot about the differences between our two societies. Her book, Tour de France, is about the mutual perceptions and assumptions. We are more touchy-feely. Germans are as cold as the weather. <laughs> French kisses, German handshakes. The French really enjoy their food. Germans just wolf it down. The French tend to look down on German food. But the whole world knows French cuisine is marvelous. Yet once a year, Germans just go crazy for a pallid seasonal vegetable. My first spring in Berlin was really very funny. Everyone was suddenly talking about asparagus. 
people would say, let's go eat some, or I'm cooking asparagus tonight. And I wondered, what is it about asparagus? Cecile Kalla has grown accustomed to the ways of the Germans, and she enjoys life in Berlin. She wouldn't want to live anywhere else in Germany. I like it here. It's very liberal, very free. There's a lot going on. A lot is changing. I would say I feel freer in Berlin than in Paris. Back home, you somehow feel more constrained. But one contrast she has accepted is Germans' collective compliance with pedestrian traffic lights. She would no longer dream of crossing on red. Maybe it's time for a trip back to France after all. Well, speaking of France, Haute Couture is the creme de la creme of the fashion circuit and Rad Hourani is part of the club. The Jordanian-born designer grew up partly in Montreal and is the first Canadian to present an Haute Couture collection in Paris. And he's made some real waves as the first to present a unisex collection. Well, his androgynous concept is a real eye-opener. Euromax reports. This is what breaking the conventions of Haute Couture looks like. Even if you wouldn't know it at first glance, this runway features women and men modeling unisex clothing. Who said that women have to dress in a certain way and men in another? Why are floral dresses and high heels only for women? What I'm saying is, I'm not trying to dress men like women or vice versa. I'm trying to create a uniform that is ageless, genderless, a-religious, and not based on trends or fashion seasons. Radhurani's designs are, without exception, monochromatic and minimalist. Radhurani has a completely different style. He creates fashion unlike anyone else, introducing totally new shapes. You just can't compare him with other famous designers. The evening before the show, the final fittings are taking place in Radhurani's small Paris studio. For his first official haute couture show, the designer wants to complete the model's androgynous look with a radical black bowl cut wig. I play around with illusions. With this model, for instance. You'd think there are several jackets, but it's actually only one. From behind, you have the feeling something's spilling out. But all these layers fit together and consist of just one item of clothing. The child of a Jordanian father and Syrian mother, the 30-year-old never went to fashion school but worked in Canada as a model scout and stylist. He came to Paris seven years ago and set up his own label in 2007. His Pret-a-Porter creations are sold in 130 boutiques worldwide. Despite that, Radurani doesn't define himself as a fashion designer. I don't consider myself a trendsetter, a fashion designer, or a photographer. I think I'm everything in one. Clothing can only partially define who we are. I need more than one outlet to express my vision. The next morning, right before the show at the Canadian Embassy in Paris. Red Hurani has had just about five hours sleep. He's tired, but totally focused. And then it's showtime. The fashion world hasn't seen anything quite like it. 22 androgynous style models in unisex uniforms. As unique as his designs are, they must still meet the high demands of haute couture. You have to be able to make a dress to measure. Because in France, we want to keep alive this know-how, which will disappear if we don't preserve haute couture. Rad Hurani has a very original creative potential, which can write a new page in the history of fashion. We're less interested in pretty dresses than in a concept which opens up possibilities. Fashion editors have Rad Hurani on their radar.
there are a lot of people out there who are young and have money and love, love, love fashion and have a very sophisticated uh, sensibility. So they may not like to see the kind of traditional type of couture fair that we've been dealing with uh, in the past and they really are ready for something very new, very brave, very courageous. Uh, this could be it. So what did the young designer make of his Paris haute couture show? There were a lot of people there. I was really touched that they all came. I'm very satisfied. Rad Harani is still new on the haute couture scene, but his groundbreaking collection went a long way towards proving his long-term potential in the industry. Speaking of long-term potential, that's something they count on in the wine business. And yet there are some mavericks amongst the younger generation of vintners who like to try out new things. Like Michael Schott of southern Germany, who in addition to his wine savvy, also has a fabla for heavy metal music. And so like rock legends Motorhead and ACDC before him, he's come up with some heavy metal vintages and hopes they'll appeal to fans of the hard stuff. Two hearts beat in this man's breast. By day, Michael Schott makes wine. He cultivates grapes and tradition. By night, he rocks with a glass of wine in his hand. Wine inspires us and has to be there. Just like the amps and the drums. Michael Schott and his friend Tobias Schaefer decided a year ago to channel their two shared passions, wine and heavy metal, into a business venture, making wine for the heavy metal community. Schott's band has made a promotional video, too. But what is the connection between wine and metal? Wine is an honest product. Grapes, soil, water. And metal is an honest kind of music. We metalheads say metal has to be true. That means authentic and real. We just dare to do something new. Well, almost new. The German rock band Die Toten Hosen also have their own brand of wine. As do The Police, Pink Floyd, ACDC, and The Rolling Stones. First came youthful rebellion and loud music, and then came the wine. It's good PR. Michael Schott reversed the order. His family has been making wine for generations on their estate in Rheinhessen. They have 80,000 vines on 17 hectares. And a small part of their yield ends up in his metal wines. Our flagship wine is the Riesling from the slopes of the Johannesburg. The entire terroir will certainly never ever all be used for metal wine. The whole family works the estate. Michael's brother, Benjamin, makes schnapps. Their mother and Michael's wife, Claudia, are in charge of sales. Their father, Edwin, is the boss. He inherited the business from his father, Friedrich Edwin Schott, who built up the business with his wife, Liesel. Liesel Schott attends the daily family lunch, where four generations come together. Metal wine is also being served. The idea of metal wine is alien to me, but I say, let the young do what they have to do. Life is full of change. Michael Schott has identified metalheads as a new market. Beefy men of a certain age rarely identified with fine wines. But Schott's Black Hills and Stoner Rock are true traditional wines made the tried and tested way, mostly with Riesling grapes. 
Soll der Wein trocken sein? Soll er The first choice sein? is dry or sweet. So We've gone for dry, but not extremely dry. So you can still feel good after two or three glasses. Praktisch nach zwei, drei Gläsern einfach noch Spaß hat, weiter zu feiern. His band, Pro Minze, rehearses once a week in the wine cellar. So the vintages have all been exposed to metal tones. We want to perform at Wacken and have you do the catering. Precisely. First we make the wine, then we storm Wacken. Enough of village fairs. Wacken is the world's biggest heavy metal festival, held each year in the sleepy north German village of the same name. Unconventional as they are, metalheads might enjoy the switch from buckets of beer to glasses of oh-so-bourgeois wine. Over now to the Austrian Alps, where many of the highbrow ski resorts are finding their well-heeled clientele harder and harder to please. And as such, the humble chairlift has gone from being a simple mode of transport to an exclusive luxury experience that's intended to draw visitors from far and wide. Well, one example is in Hochzillertal, where they now have a cable car complete with surround sound, champagne and heated seats with massage function, which makes you wonder why you would even want to get out at the top. The Alpine ski resorts pamper and woo skiers and snowboarders with well-groomed slopes and luxury accommodation. The resorts try to outclass one another with more and better offerings. Now, Hochzilletal Kaltenbach has opened a ski gondola of superlatives designed by German carmaker BMW. It may be plain on the outside, but on the inside, it's like a luxury car. The BMW gondola is the ski resort's latest attraction and advertising for the carmaker. The center console features the BMW iDrive system. It controls the multimedia systems. And this is the original seat heating. You can set that and the massage function here. Daniel Erharter and Michaela Jennewein of Austria have come to take the gondola on a test spin up the mountain. It's really a unique experience to ride in a gondola like this, so we thought we'd treat ourselves to it. Something romantic at airy heights after a day full of stress. But the VIP treatment is not to be had for the price of an ordinary ski pass. A ticket for two costs 150 euros, including champagne and breakfast in an alpine chalet. The trip lasts just 13 minutes. So how was it? It takes a while to get the hang of the navigation system, but it's really fine to sit in the gondola, just the two of us, and it was a really nice ride. If the ride lasted longer, I'm sure you could enjoy it more. The massage and the music and the champagne was just fabulous. <laughs> Tourist associations and investors are always on the lookout for new ways to impress patrons with the quality of their resorts. Switzerland boasts a ski gondola that rotates on the way up, and passengers can sweat for a quarter of an hour at 80 to 100 degrees Celsius in this Finnish sauna gondola. Switzerland's Hanik Alpan serves a pendulous fondue. And on this fairy tale gondola, passengers can listen to stories. Gondolas are no longer just a way to get to the top of the slope. In winter tourism nowadays, clients do in fact demand something special. And we try to stay on the ball with innovative ideas. Even modest winter resorts have to come up with ways to keep the guests coming. With over 180 kilometers of slopes, Hochzillertal Kaltenbach numbers among the larger alpine ski areas. Michaela Jennewein and Daniel Erharter are enjoying another brunch at an alpine lodge, 
It was included in the ski gondola ticket. Also notwendig ist es sicher nicht. Such a luxurious gondola is certainly not a necessity, but it was still a nice experience for us to enjoy it once. Einfach mal diesen Luxus auch zu genießen zu dürfen. I'm sure it'd be nice as a wedding or birthday present, or for a special occasion where you really want to treat yourself to something. The way back down the slopes, however, is still very much the same. Well, that brings us to the end of our Euromax highlights. We hope you enjoyed this edition, and until we meet again, all the best from us in Berlin, and auf Wiedersehen.